So once again, the main outline of how we're dealing with magnetic fields or how we're thinking about magnetic fields is that the magnetic field is created by a moving source charge. Any moving charge, whether it's just a lump of charge in motion or current flowing through a wire creates a magnetic field, which can be just thought of as just this, these invisible arrows around it in space. And that magnetic field exerts a force on other test charges as long as they're moving. And again, the test charge could be a lump of charge that's moving or it could be a wire with current flowing through it. And of course, ultimately what's really happening is the one wire is exerting a force on the other wire or one of the moving charges is, moving a, is exerting a force on the other moving charge. But it's much more convenient mathematically and conceptually to think of it as one of the charges creates a magnetic field which exerts a force on the other charge. Just like we tend to think of one of the charges creating an electric field which exerts a force on the other charge. And in terms of directionality, uh, for the idea of creating the magnetic field, the magnetic field is always going to be perpendicular to the motion of the source charge. If we're talking about an object that's got charge and is moving, motion means velocity of that test object. If we're talking about a wire with current flowing through it, we mean perpendicular to the current, per perpendicular to the wire itself. And also the magnetic field is gonna be perpendicular to the radius vector from the wire to the location of interest or from the moving charge to the location of interest. For example, let's say you have a wire, let's say a, a wire that's pointing straight out of the page and straight into the page. So this wire right here, And let's say that wire is carrying current pointing straight out of the board. So I, the current is pointing outwards from the board towards the viewer, towards you. That's gonna create magnetic field everywhere around the wire. And based on these two properties, the fact that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the motion, in other words, the current, and perpendicular to the radius, that narrows it down in all cases to just two possible directions. Like if you want to know the magnetic field here, if we draw out a radius from the wire to the location of interest, What are the only possible directions that are perpendicular to the current and perpendicular to that radius? What directions could be perpendicular to both of those, current and radius? Either up or down. Yeah, in this case, upwards and downwards are the only possibilities that are perpendicular to both of those. So just from those perpendicular properties, we know that the magnetic field is either upwards or downwards at that location. The whole point of a right-hand rule is to just uh, sp specify one or the other of those. And there are several options you could do here. One way is you could put your hand at the point of interest, stretch out towards the wire, curl your fingers in the direction currents flowing, and your thumb tells you the direction of the field. So this magnetic field would be upwards. Or alternatively, you could put your hand at the location of the wire, point your thumb in the direction current is flowing, and the curl of your fingers tells you the magnetic field everywhere around the wire. So everywhere around the wire, we should expect magnetic field curling, uh, I guess that would be counterclockwise. So we should expect magnetic fields circulating, the, the field lines are gonna be circulating around that wire, which suggests at this location, that's gonna be upwards. So either way, we get upwards magnetic field at this location. But then down here, for instance, the radius vector is downwards, so the magnetic field has to be horizontal. And according to the right-hand rule, thumb in the direction of current, curl of your fingers tells you the direction of the magnetic field. That's gonna to be to the right at this point. And all this we're doing here is called the first right-hand rule, or just variations on the first right-hand rule. Anything involving the relationship between the moving source charge or current source current and the magnetic field it creates, that's all first right hand rule.
Any questions on that so far? I'm still a little confused how you were able to figure out the um, direction of the magnetic field at that point was upwards. Like, understand the whole counterclockwise thing, but how did you know it was going to be upwards? Uh, well, counterclockwise means above the wire, it's to the left. To the left side of the wire, it's down. Under the wire, it's to the right. And to the right side of the wire, it's up. So, because uh, if you think of this as like a circulation sort of thing, the magnetic field is going to form loops. The field lines themselves form loops with a direction. But the actual magnetic field at any point is tangent to that loop. So at this point, the magnetic field is straight up. At this point, the magnetic field is straight to the left. At this point, the magnetic field is diagonally down and to the right. So if you want to draw out an actual vector, it's just going to be a straight arrow tangent to that loop. But the loop is the field line diagram. It tells you, it shows you the overall trend of those, those directions. Uh, any other questions on that so far? Um, I'm a little, I get the upwards direction and the rightwards direction, but like, are both of those existing at the same time or are those for like two different things? They are at the same time, but at different locations because a, a field is a value assigned to every location in space. So at this location, the magnetic field is this upwards vector. At this location, the magnetic field is this rightwards vector. So the magnetic field is a specific value at every location in space around that wire. Okay, so the rightwards one was just um, you figuring out the magnetic field like at a different point. Yeah, this would be the magnetic okay. field at this location below the wire. Okay, thank you. So with a little more detail that might look like, uh, like if this is the wire pointing straight out, then the magnetic field would look like if we draw in a whole bunch of vectors, something like this, and then getting weaker as we get further out. And then even weaker as we get further away. But the idea is every location in space has a value of the magnetic field associated with it. And since it's a vector field, value in this case means magnitude and direction. Can you find the magnetic field at a point? Yeah, in fact, this uh, what we've drawn here is the, these arrows represent the magnetic field, even though we don't know the magnetic In fact, there is no electric field here. So magnetic field and electric field are only really related in the sense that they're both caused by charge. But electric field is the effect that charge has on the world around it, just because it is charge. Magnetic field is the effect that a charge has on the world around it because it's moving charge. So drawing the magnetic field caused by moving charge and drawing the electric field caused by charge are two completely different things. You don't need one of them in order to find the other one. Uh, so in this case, for instance, current is flowing along the wire. That current is charge in motion, so it creates a magnetic field. But the total charge of the wire is zero, so it doesn't create any electric field at all. In fact, the, the wire itself, presumably the wire contains the same number of protons and electrons. Total charge is zero, so it does not create an electric field at all. But the electrons are moving while the protons are not moving. So the electrons create a magnetic field, which isn't canceled out by the protons because the protons are not moving. So that's really what's going on with the wire. The electrons and protons create zero total electric field because as charges, they cancel out. But the electrons are moving, protons are not moving. So the electrons create the magnetic field as they move. So that's why from a wire with current, we would expect a magnetic field, but no electric field at all. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> And one of the really important results of this is what happens if you've got current not only going in a straight line, but current flowing in a loop. If you've got a, a loop of wire with current flowing in it, like uh, something like 
this, just a loop of wire. Assume there's a battery in it somewhere causing current to flow. If you've got current flowing in a loop, that's going to create a very predictable magnetic field in a very specific sort of pattern. If you've got a loop, uh, let me say we have this, let's just treat this as a rectangle for now. If we just got a rectangle of wire, let's say we're looking at it from the top down. So rectangle of wire viewed from the top down. <clears throat> and let's say there is current flowing, uh, let's say counterclockwise. So these arrows represent the direction current is flowing. The emotion of charge within the wire. That moving charge is going to create magnetic field. And we can figure out the direction of the magnetic field using any of those right hand rules, the, any of the first type of right hand rules. For example, we've got in this section of wire, we've got current going upwards. What would be the magnetic field on the left side of that? If you got current upwards, what would be the magnetic field on the left side? Inwards? Right hand rule suggests outwards on this side though. It should be, yeah, it should be outwards on this side and then inwards on the right side. So we should expect magnetic field to be circulating, specifically circulating like this. Based on the right hand rule, point your thumb upwards, you get circulation outwards on the left side and then to your left in front of the wire and then inwards on the right side and looping back to the left behind the wire. Or to put it another way, if you just care about, let's say this point, you could put your hand here, stretch out your fingers towards the wire, curl your fingers upwards and inwards is the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, I do not appear to be on mute. Is your speaker on? Okay, can everyone hear me? Everyone else? Okay, maybe your speaker settings. Uh, so at this point, the other variant, if you put your hand here, stretch out towards the wire, curl your fingers, your thumb is pointing inwards. So at this point, we should expect magnetic field to be inwards. Whereas over here, we should expect outwards. And in fact, that should be true everywhere to the right of that section of wire. But what would you expect to happen to the magnetic field as you get further away from that section of wire? Yeah, magnetic fields should get weaker as you get further from the wire. So let's sketch that out. If we have magnetic field outwards on the left side, inwards on the right side. So outwards, inwards, and then getting weaker as we get further away. Weaker, weaker, weaker. Does that work better? Can you hear me all right? Okay, yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, good, glad that worked out. So this, this wire creates magnetic field outwards on the left side, inwards on the right side. But if we take a look at the same magnetic field created by this piece of wire, we've got current flowing downwards. So that's gonna create magnetic field, again, by the right-hand rule, inwards on the left side, outwards on the right side. So inwards on the left side, outwards on the right side. And as before, strong when we're close and weaker as we get further away. That should be outwards. Okay. 
And then we could try the same thing with, for example, the top section of wire. We've got current flowing to the left. So by the first right hand rule, uh, curl your fingers around that wire with your thumb pointing in the direction of current. That suggests inwards magnetic field on top and outwards magnetic field underneath. So inwards on top into the board and outwards underneath. And as before, getting weaker as we get further away. And likewise, if we try underneath, we've got uh, electrical current going to the right. So above, again, curling your fingers with the first right hand rule. Uh, weaker, what do you mean within the wire? Like within the interior of the loop? Yeah, yeah, it is getting weaker as you get further away. So for example, if you're looking at the magnetic field caused by this section of wire, you're gonna get strong magnetic field here and then getting weaker and then weaker and weaker as you get further away. So it is gonna be strongest close to the wire and weaker further from the wire if you're looking at just the magnetic field caused by that section of wire alone. And likewise, this wire, we've got current flowing to the right. So above we've got outwards magnetic field and below we've got inwards magnetic field. So outwards, inwards. As usual, strong when we're close and then getting weaker and weaker and weaker. Strong when we're close, getting weaker and weaker. So that would be the magnetic field contributions. And all these vectors represent magnetic field. Magnetic field contributions from each section of the wire. But how do we find the total magnetic field at some location? You have to add the vectors? Yeah, we would add the vectors together. And in the inside, all of these vectors are pointing in the same direction. So are those gonna combine or cancel out? What's gonna happen if you add a whole bunch of vectors that are pointing in the same direction as each other? Yeah, those combine. You end up with a very strong vector pointing in the outwards direction. So if you care about the total magnetic field, which is ultimately what matters, the total magnetic field in the interior of the loop is gonna be very strong and in the outwards direction in this case. And it turns out that's actually the strongest, I think, I should actually run the numbers on this. I think it ends up being the strongest in the middle of the loop because the this vector has gotten weaker, but also it hasn't gotten as weak as it could be. And it's combining with another vector that's gotten somewhat weaker, but hasn't gotten as weak as, it's could, as it could be. But in general, in the interior of the loop, you get a very strong and pretty consistent magnetic field all in this one direction. Meanwhile, on the outside, we've got inwards and outwards, inwards and outwards, inwards and outwards. Opposite directions are gonna partially cancel out. They're not gonna completely cancel out because these are not the same magnitude, but they will mostly cancel out. So what you end up with is in the interior, you get a strong magnetic field towards the viewer. On the exterior, you get a weak magnetic field away from the viewer. Any questions on that so far? Wouldn't the magnetic fields on the exterior just add up to get like a strong magnetic field on the outside? On the outside, we are adding them, but we've got a, a vector pointing inwards and a vector pointing outwards. Since they're in opposite directions, they're going to partially cancel out. Can you explain why, how on the outside, why there are vectors going both ways? Again, yeah. versus just outwards or versus just inwards? In this case, for instance, we were, we were taking a look at the magnetic field caused by this wire so you've got magnetic field pointing, or sorry, electrical current flowing downwards. That creates inwards magnetic field on this side. So this blue one is from the uh, left wire. From the left wire. 
but also we have to consider the influence of the right side wire. The right side wire has current pointing upwards, so that's going to create outwards pointing magnetic field on the left side, not just immediately to the left, but everywhere to the left. Of course, getting weaker as you get further away. So this is the outwards pointing magnetic field from the right wire. And we're at kind of a weird angle from the top and bottom wires. So that ends up providing a very weak magnetic field. But even if we did consider it, below the top wire, we've got a weak outwards magnetic field. And above the bottom wire, we've got a weak outwards magnetic field as well. So we end up with a strong inwards magnetic field from the wire we're really close to and weak outwards magnetic fields from all three other wires. When you add all those together, these three weak outwards partially cancel out, mostly cancel out this strong inwards vector. So the overall result is gonna be a weak inwards vector. And in fact, that's gonna be true everywhere over here, everywhere up here, everywhere outside the loop. You get a weak inwards pointing vector. Any questions on that so far? So inside the interior of the loop, you don't get any like cancellation of magnetic fields because they're all like sections of the wire are pointing like into the board, yeah. or I mean out of the board. Uh, yeah, this section creates outwards magnetic field. 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 So the interior is experiencing outwards pointing magnetic field from every single piece of the wire. So those all combine to a very strong outwards magnetic field. So in fact, we could just write out the total magnetic field as just a very large outwards pointing vector. And likewise, in the outside regions, we're going to have a very weak inwards pointing vector. So we could just combine those and say everywhere in the outside region, we've just got a weak outward pointing vector. I'm sorry, uh, inwards pointing vector. So the magnetic field is going to look something like this. In the interior of the loop, assuming the, the current is flowing uh, counterclockwise, we end up with a very strong outwards pointing magnetic field in the interior of the loop and weak outwards pointing magnetic field pointing away from the viewer on the exterior of the loop. Or I guess that would be into the board in this case. And fortunately, instead of doing that all that analysis every single time, there's another right hand rule that works for loops of current. Because can you come up with the right hand rule that relates the direction of the current and the direction of this strong magnetic field in the interior? The current itself has sort of a curvature associated with it, right? We're got, we've got current curling around. What happens if you curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction current is flowing? What do you get for the direction of your thumb? Yeah, thumb. well, if you curl your fingers like this, my thumb's not pointing up, my thumb is pointing outwards. And yeah, that's the direction of the magnetic field. So this is a very convenient shortcut. If you're and, and another variation of the first right hand rule, it's still called the first right hand rule or the first type of right hand rule because it's talking about this relationship, moving source charge, the current, and magnetic field caused by it. So as a shortcut, if you're talking about a loop of wire with current, curl your fingers of your right hand in the direction current is flowing, and your thumb should tell you the direction of the strong magnetic field in the inside of the loop. And then outside of the loop, you'll get magnetic field in the opposite direction and weaker. Any questions on that so far? Then let's take a look at this same phenomenon in three dimensions. 
let's say we have a loop that is held uh, horizontally, like in the flat x, y plane. And let's see if I can draw that kind of three dimensionally. So let's say you've got this, this loop of wire. So this end is close to you and this end is further from you. And let's say we've got current flowing like this. So on the side close to you, current is flowing to your left. On the side far from you, current is flowing to you. No. On the side close to you, current is flowing to your right. On the side far from you, current is flowing to your left. Or we might describe that as counterclockwise wind viewed from above. If you're standing up here looking down, you're going to see current flowing counterclockwise. So if we want to figure out the direction of the magnetic field, take the direction current is flowing, curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction current is flowing, and my, now my thumb is pointing upwards. So that suggests in the middle of this loop, we're gonna get a very strong upwards magnetic field. So interior to the loop, we get this strong upwards magnetic field. And then everywhere outside the loop, we get a weaker downwards magnetic field. And of course, that's going to get even weaker as you get further away. But the thing is, it's not just existing in that flat plane. There's magnetic field everywhere around this loop. And what sort of shapes do magnetic field lines tend to form if you draw out a complete magnetic field line diagram? Do they start somewhere? Do they end somewhere? What sort of shapes do magnetic field lines tend to form? They're circular. Yeah, they're circular. They always loop back on themselves, except occasionally for straight lines. You do end up getting a straight line right through the center if you actually measure this. And of course, you can measure this with a compass. If you just take a compass and hold it somewhere nearby, while current is slowing in the loop, the compass is going to twitch to align with the existing magnetic field because a compass is a magnetic dipole, and a dipole will align with the magnetic field. But if you measure it everywhere, you end up with loops with uh, field lines packed close together on the inside. And spread out further on the outside. And it ends up looking like this. We get magnetic field pointing upwards in the interior, downwards on the exterior, forming loop shapes, field lines packed close together in the interior representing a strong magnetic field, spread out further on the exterior representing a weaker magnetic field. So this is what the magnetic field caused by this loop of current is going to look like. And of course, this should really be three dimensional. We're also going to have loops coming out like this, loops going behind, but these form loops upwards through the middle and downwards on the outside. So this would be the magnetic field shape we should expect from any loop of wire with current flowing through it. And this is if it, specifically if it's a circular loop, but any shape loop is going to be this general idea, flowing in one direction through the middle and very strong with direction based on the right hand rule, and then flowing the other direction and weaker on the exterior, and looping around because that's what magnetic field lines do. They don't start anywhere, they don't end anywhere, they either come in from infinity and go out to infinity, or they form complete cycles, complete loops. Any questions on that magnetic field so far? Now let's compare this. Where have you seen an electric field 
that forms loops like this. Ignoring what's happening in the middle. For just from outside, where have you seen an electric field that looks like this? If this is an electric field, if you've got a whole bunch of electric field coming out of one point, what sort of charge has to be at that one point? What sort of charge do electric field lines come out from? Yeah, that's got to be a positive charge. So presumably, if you have an electric field shaped like this, you should assume that there's positive charge at this high voltage zone where all the field lines are coming out from. And all the field lines are going towards what sort of thing? Yeah, a negative charge. So presumably down here, there's a negative charge. And what do we call that if we've got an object with positive charge on one end and negative charge on the other? If you've got a positive end and a negative end, what do we call that object? Dipole? It's a dipole, yeah. This is an electric dipole. Dipole just means it has two poles, two opposite ends, positive and negative. So an electric dipole is an object with a positive end and a negative end, an end with not enough electrons and an end with too many electrons. And that forms a field lines shaped like this, coming out of one end and curving back into the other end. But what we have here, this loop of wire with current is a magnetic dipole. It counts as a dipole, even though it doesn't have a clear end of one type and end of an opposite type. It's not like this is a bar with uh, positive magnetic particles on one end and negative magnetic particles on one end, because there's no such thing as positive or negative magnetic particles. There is no magnetic charge. So this does not conventionally seem like a dipole. It doesn't have one type of charge on one end and a different type of charge on the other end. But the flow of current in this loop creates magnetic field that's shaped almost exactly like the electric field caused by an electric dipole. So even though what's causing it looks very different, the fact that the shape of the field, the shape of the magnetic field here matches the shape of the electric field here means that this loop of wire with current is a magnetic dipole because it's got the same sort of behavior. That means that for all practical purposes, this loop of wire with current flowing through it is the magnetic equivalent of an electric dipole. And similarly, it's going to act as a compass. If you've got a, a loop of wire with current flowing through it and you hang it from a string and allow it to rotate, it's going to swivel to align with any existing magnetic field, just like an electric dipole would swivel to align with the existing uh, electric field. One slight difference, though, in the middle of the electric dipole, which direction is the electric field pointing? Electric field should always point from what to what? Positive to negative. Yeah, positive charge to negative charge. So in the interior of the electric dipole, electric field is going to be pointing from positive to negative. But in the interior of this magnetic dipole, the magnetic field is pointing upwards. Because magnetic field forms loops, it's, a, it's continuous. Whereas electric field has a point that everything comes out of and a point that everything goes into. For magnetic fields, that's not true. There's no source or sink. There's no single point that these field lines are coming out of. There's no single point that they're going into. So that's one of the big differences between magnetic field and electric field. Electric field field lines come out of single points of charge or go into single points of charge. They, have a, they, they can have a start and an end. Magnetic field lines never have a start or an end. They either go in loops or they come in from infinity and go out to infinity. So that's probably the biggest difference in terms of what the field lines look like. Uh, we can still define a dipole moment vector though. For the electric dipole, the dipole moment vector is a vector pointing from the positive end towards the negative or from the negative end towards the positive end. 
dipole moment vector. And note that that dipole moment vector is not the same as the electric field it creates. The dipole moment vector is just describing the alignment of the dipole. We can do the same thing with the magnetic dipole. The magnetic dipole moment is going to be a vector pointing like this. So this is the dipole moment vector for the magnetic dipole. And for the electric dipole, we describe this orientation by saying this is the positive end and this is the negative end, or positive pole and negative pole. For the magnetic field, there isn't really a positive or negative aspect to it. But yeah, we call this the north end, the north pole of the magnet. And this would be the south pole of the magnetic dipole. So the dipole moment points from the south pole towards the north pole. And also the north pole is what we call the pole that all the field lines seem to be coming out of. Again, if you ignore what's going on in between, because what's really happening is the field lines form loops. But if you ignore what's happening inside, the north pole is the end that all the field lines seem to come out of. The south pole is the end that all the field lines seem to go into. And you end up getting the exact behavior also from a permanent bar magnet. If you just got a lump of iron where all the atoms are aligned, or most of them are aligned anyway, that acts like a permanent magnet. So if you just have a bar magnet, typically with one end labeled north, one end labeled south, that's also going to create a magnetic field of its own because of the alignment of its atoms. With magnetic field lines coming out of the north pole, going into the south pole. And those also are going to form loops. And you can measure this with a compass. As usual, if you just hold a compass at, let's say, this location, the compass is going to swivel to align with the existing magnetic field. Where are the poles coming from? In the case of the loop of wire, the poles are not really physical objects. The poles are just the region that, or the side that the field lines seem to come out of. The south pole is the side that the field lines seem to go into. And it's actually the same for the bar magnet. The north pole of the bar magnet isn't really a physical object. The north pole is just the side or the end, the region that the field lines seem to come out of. The south pole isn't an object. It's not like this is charged up with south particles. There's no such thing as south particles. It's just the end of the magnet that the field lines go into. But unlike the electric dipole, if we were to cut this open, like let's say we cut a hole in the magnet and put a compass in the middle, it turns out the field lines just continue straight through in the interior. These field lines all form loops. It's just that they are loops that pass through the interior of this solid object. So these are all magnetic fields forming loop shapes, if you were to measure it. And one of the big other results of this, one of the other big differences between electric versus magnetic, let's say you take a dipole, an electrical dipole, positive end, negative end, and you break it in half. If you break an electric dipole in half, what do you now have? Just like a single charge? Yeah, or rather two single charges. One of them, one end that's still positive, one end that's still negative. So you take that electric dipole, because an electric dipole is all about having lots of missing electrons at one end and lots of extra electrons at the other end. If you break that in half, What you now have is an object that's positively charged and an object that's negatively charged. But if you take a magnetic dipole, that bar magnet, for instance, the bar magnet doesn't have a north end and a south end because of locations of charges. The bar magnet has a north and a south end because of the orientation of the atoms inside. The bar magnet is a magnet because all the atoms are pointing in roughly the same direction. So an electric dipole is about where the charge is located, the fact that the charge is imbalanced. A magnetic dipole is about the fact that all the atoms are oriented in roughly the same direction. 
So you've got a north end that all the dipoles are pointing to and a south end that all the dipoles are pointing away from. If we break that in half, what do we now have? Do we break that into a north piece and a south piece? Or what does, if you ignore the bottom half, what does the top half now look like? Does that still count as a dipole? Yes. Yeah, this still has, I mean, the, the magnetic dipole in the case of a bar magnet is just an object whose atoms are all oriented in the same direction. If you break that in half, the top half is still an object whose, whose atoms are all aligned in the same direction. So this still counts as a magnetic dipole with a north pole and a south pole. The bottom half is also all oriented in the same direction. So the bottom half still counts as a dipole moment, a bar magnet with a north pole and a south pole. So if you break an electric dipole in half, you get two charged objects, no more dipole. You break a magnetic dipole in half, specifically a bar magnet, you get two smaller magnetic dipoles, two smaller bar magnets. So that's one of the other enormous differences between electric stuff and magnetic stuff. Any other questions on that? Do you mind quickly repeating what an electric dipole is again? Yeah, the electric dipole is just an object that has positive charge at one end, that is not enough electrons, and negative charge at the other end, that is too many electrons. Uh, so for instance, certain molecules count as dipoles, like if you've got a molecule where one atom has extra electrons and the other atom is missing electrons, then you've got a negative end and a positive end. Or if you just take like a plastic rod and add extra electrons to one side and remove electrons from the other side, that now has a negative end and a positive end. So that counts as a dipole. But if you were to break it in half, you no longer have a dipole, you just have a positively charged object and separately a negatively charged object. Any other questions on that? All right, then we can look into more right hand rules and the induced current stuff next time. See you then. Thank you. You're welcome.